Well, the uh, leaves are not changing fast enough to take another picture today, so we'll uh, we'll let you wait another day or two to see if we can get a little more color than what we have right now. Uh, we're working backwards from Revelation to Genesis and my, some of my favorite sections of Scripture. Today we've got quite an interesting passage of Scripture that I'm going to make a few comments on. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at word, verse 8 by itself. Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Well, there was a time, and I'm old enough to remember that time, when if people raised their hands in a service, it meant that they were probably charismatic Pentecostals who believed in uh, supernatural healings at demand uh, for everybody, no matter what the illness was, and speaking in tongues, and several other Pentecostal issues. And it caused a lot of splits in a lot of churches, and so... Baptists were scared to death to raise their hands, even though there's several passages of Scripture that talk about raising holy hands. Now, that's not so much of an issue anymore. There are a lot of Baptist churches now that are raising hands that don't believe in the speaking in tongues and don't believe in uh, healings on demand for everyone. Uh, so it's not as much of an issue as it used to be, but it certainly was at one time. However, I will say this quickly to you. God is infinitely more concerned about the position of your heart than he is in the position of your hands. You don't have to lift your hands in order to be deeply praying uh, with a great concentration and uh, uh, with any special spiritual blessing by raising your hands. If you feel like raising your hands, that's fine. If you don't feel like raising your hands, that's fine. What he cares about is the attitude and the position of your heart. Uh, I've seen people raise their hands uh, who were talking over their shoulder to somebody else about something other than worship. And I've seen people uh, who don't raise their hands who you couldn't wake uh, away from their prayer uh, or their praise uh, with a sledgehammer because their heart and their mind is set on praise and worship of God. So let's remember it's, uh, it's what's coming out of the heart that's really important, not the position of our body or our hands. Uh, so uh, that takes care of verse 8. So let's take a look at verse 9 through 12, because this certainly has caused a lot of problems in today's uh, pro uh, politically correct world that we live in. Verses 9 through 12. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and with gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction without, uh, with entire submission, but I do not allow women to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Boy, has that caused a lot of problems in today's women's movement. And uh, uh, everybody likes to try to avoid this subject because uh, they, uh, they can get in big trouble. Political correctness uh, gets into the way of uh, what this really says. As with all scriptures, it must be taken in full context. And uh, we know that uh, at one time, uh, women that were loose and that uh, very often of ill repute, dressed in a gaudy way, uh, revealing way, enticing way, and therefore this passage of scripture is discouraging that. Uh, the other thing that I would say to you about verses 9 and 10 is uh, that uh, once again we have to look at the customs of the day uh, and the, the reason for the jewelry and the uh, dress. Uh, certainly God does not care uh, whether a woman has uh, old worn out jeans, of course today worn out jeans is a fashionable thing, but uh, he doesn't care whether you have uh, worn out clothes, he doesn't care if you have the most expensive designer clothes, what he cares about is your attitude of the heart and your, your purpose of worship and the purpose for dressing as you do. Let me also say quickly that uh, God does want women uh, to dress properly and discreetly 
uh, modestly uh, so that they are not a stumbling block to men uh, by uh, revealing too much of their body and that uh, doesn't uh, mean that it has to be low cut or that it has to be short skirted uh, for many times the way that it fits uh, can be uh, enticement to man and uh, we don't want to get legalistic about this. We don't want to, we don't want to worry about uh, every little piece of clothing that a woman puts on for a man should not not be lusting after a woman anyway. Uh, but again, I think there's, a, there's certainly a certain line of uh, what's uh, tasteful and what is enticing and what is provocative. And so I believe that women know the difference. I know that men know the difference. And... Uh, I know that men are not going to, uh, who are trying to be godly, going to look at a woman with lust in his heart. Uh, but in any case, that gets us down to the hardest part of this passage of Scripture, which is uh, that women are to be quiet and in submission. Uh, I think if you go to Ephesians 5 and you look at verses uh, 20 and following, you'll find that we're to be in submission, both men and women, to God. However, God does have a, a hierarchy, if you will, of, of the family where he has put men responsible to God in charge of the family. That doesn't mean that he doesn't treasure and weigh carefully his wife and children's opinions on things. Uh, but ultimately, someone in the family has to make the final decision and God gave that responsibility to man. And you'll see very clearly that if man loves his wife as Christ loved the church, again we're in Ephesians 5.25, 5.20 in that area, uh, if a man loves his wife as Christ loved the church is willing to die for her, uh, a woman would have no problem at all submitting to somebody that loved her that much because he would never uh, grind her under his heel or demand things that uh, are not uh, uh, god godly and appropriate. So we see then in the dealing with uh, women in submission that we're not talking about being a servant and we're not talking about mindlessness where they just uh, force their husband to make every decision or where their husband wants to make every decision and never considers his wife. Uh, so we, we see the, the balance here. The instruction of man and, and uh, submission uh, and teaching is a tricky issue. And once again, it uh, comes back to the fact that uh, a man is in charge of the home and we want to be careful that that authority uh, is not um, circumvented or undermined. Can a woman teach? Absolutely. The exercising authority over a man uh, isn't is an area where we get into some trouble and that's why it's wise for women to teach women and for women uh, to not teach men however there are certainly some women that are godly and that do not do it in a in a, a lording over kind of a way uh, Billy Graham's uh, daughter um, and several other of the women in ministry uh, do not exercise authority over men, but they are able to teach good biblical principles without distorting that authority of the man. Uh, it's a tricky subject and it's uh, got to be dealt with on a church by church basis. Uh, Billy Graham and others have written material, I think Radio Bible Class, uh, The uh, Daily Bread, made one of the good uh, statements about uh, divorced and remarried men being deacons and I would say that this applies very well to women teaching um, and that was that if the church would not receive the man as a deacon uh, then it wouldn't matter whether you believe that that was appropriate for a divorced and remarried man to be able to be a deacon or not because if the church won't receive it you do a disservice both to the man and to the uh, uh, church by putting somebody that the church doesn't feel is qualified to be a deacon in that position. And I would say the same thing is true about women teaching. Uh, women teaching, if it's not widely received by the church, 
do a disservice to the woman who's trying to teach and a disservice to the congregation who are going to be upset by her teaching because of passages of scripture like this. Uh, I think you'll find in our society today that women teaching, as long as they're not exhorting authority over the men and as long as they're not doing it in an ungodly way, uh, where they're uh, trying to do a holier-than-thou kind of an approach to teaching, uh, is probably pretty well accepted in most churches today. Uh, however, we want to understand uh, the relationship between the man and the woman in this teaching situation and uh, be sure that we understand that uh, this is a, an issue of the hierarchy of the family uh, more than it is an issue of women being inferior or women being uh, downtrodden and, and uh, disrespected. So uh, balance with good taste and uh, the women uh, understand that uh, uh, I believe that God wants all of us men to love our wives and uh, the women in our lives with respect and honor. Uh, which uh, the scriptures clearly teach. And uh, as long as we have that kind of relationship and we love our women as Christ loved the church and was willing to lay down his life for her, I don't think women will have any problem at all finding the balance of uh, this passage of scripture. And that's a lengthy thought for the day, but I hope that it blessed you and I hope that you'll be able to see the reasoning behind uh, Paul writing this to Timothy and also the reason that we struggle with some of that today in our society. That's my thought for the day. <laughs> it's a long thought, isn't it? God bless you and have a great day.